I'm going to give a very brief introduction of myself and, uh, and then let uh, each of these gentlemen introduce themselves and then we'll get started. Um, I actually was really excited when Katrina and Andy both talked about the good personalization experience that they have as users, uh, which were both in e-commerce. Um, my background's in e-commerce. Um, my background's in machine learning and algorithms for e-commerce <laughs> and for personalization. <laughs> so it was all very exciting. Um, I was brought to Browsy as the SVP International Revenue, um, despite my lack of a background in ad tech, um, because we are a personalization company focused on algorithms and machine learning for personalization. And we said, you know what? The ad tech part isn't the important part here. The important part is the personalization, the user experience, the customer journey, uh, and of course the, the technology, the data, the algorithms, all of that, which I understand very well. Um, I've been at Browsy for uh, about six or months, seven months, so I, I'm, I have higher seniority than, than Katrina at FT. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined here by um, Sherzad, who's the Director of Commercial Operations at Lad Bible, uh, by Asher Linsman, who is the Head of Monetization at Boons Media. Um, also, Greedy Finance is one of their bigger sites, if you're familiar with it. Um, and Lior Fisher, our co-founder and uh, Chief Product Officer here at Browsy. Um, Sherzad, do you want to uh, do a brief intro? Introduce myself yeah. again. Yeah. Hi all, uh, Shazza <laughs> from Lab Bible. Uh, been about four months since I joined Lab Bible, and before that I was at a company called Minute Media for about seven years. Um, years at, um, you know, we were at Gimme Sport, I left to rejoin there, and then I, I spent three years at Canary Wharf working for Trinity Mirror. It wasn't a rich PLC then, it was a PLC, but it was called Trinity Mirror, and so on and so forth. Um, I suppose my role at LAD is, um, LAD Bubble has five core web properties, and I'm in charge of monetization of, of those uh, properties, and um, look after the sort of uh, uh, the editorial content strategies, as well as you know how much money we make on the back of how many people come to our sites. So, um, yeah, that's me. Cool. Um, so hello, I'm Asha. Um, for those of you that don't know us, we are Boons. We're quite a new publisher. Um, we've been around for around seven years. Uh, we have 10 domains um, across a few verticals. Um, arts and entertainment and finance are our biggest ones. I joined in 2019 as a content writer when we were still quite small. Uh, so we've grown, we've grown quite a bit. Um, and now we've got around 60 million uh, monthly visits across the world. Um, I oversee all of the monetization ops and also direct uh, the technical strategy um, in terms of revenue. Um, it's worth noting that you know, we're slightly different from the, most of the publishers speaking here today in that all of our, or most of our revenue still comes from programmatic and um, you know, RTB. Um, so my kind of area of expertise is more on the kind of yield management, um, header bidding, optimization path. And that's kind of what I find most interesting about uh, programmatic. All right, and hi, I'm Lior Fisher. I'm uh, the Chief Product Officer at Browsy, one of the co-founders. Um, been around Browsy for the last seven years or so. Prior to that, at fintech companies and seller operators. Um, and I'm in charge at Browsy, basically, just to touch base to the panel beforehand, that if we say that we have an eye, we really have an eye, and not just bluffing and saying that we have something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Even though he doesn't have a postdoc. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't. But, I, but I've been in, in investment panels where people just ask, do you have an eye? And if you do, they say, all right, I'll write you a check. And then if you don't, they're like, why don't you have an eye, right? Or why don't you say you have an eye? I hope these days are all gone now, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the notes that I have tell me that uh, people don't like uh, most advertising, uh, <laughs> even if it's personalized. Um, <laughs> So uh, one of the things that I heard in the previous panel, um, I think Terry, you were saying, you know, it's that extra page view. What can we do to get that extra page view? It, it's also very important. Um, and, and why do we want the extra page view, right? We want the extra page view well, so our content can be read, uh, but also so that more ads can be seen, right? And so then there's a choice around how many ads are going to be on the page so that it's worth it that they saw that page, but that it's not too many, that then the user's not gonna go and see the next page, right? 
Um, so what the Browsy technology does um, is that we just optimize between that. It's our big focus, optimizing between UX and revenue. Um, and so that's the main topic of today. Although we're not focused on browsing, we just want to talk about this balance high level. Um, so my first question for Sarah Sherzad is um, how UX nowadays requires more attention than it perhaps used to, um, and how much UX is a decision-making factor in your role um, in the more commercial operations side. What we are kind of looking at is not a single person uses or consumes the content the same way um, or the same speed, the same kind of reading, scanning, or, or having the same experience. So we are 90% plus mobile publisher, and our audience is very young, and they've got very short uh, attention span or the time they spend on websites and, and so on and so forth. So what I tried to do since I joined, I tried to get away from those hard-coded specific ad slots where you can very easily be like banner blind and just fly through to move to more algorithmic, more dynamic, depending on how quickly you're going through the page. If you're going really quick, we don't even serve you an ad. Mm -hmm. So if, you go, if you're engaged, we always serve the ad, sort of predicting that where you're going to be, you know, the next. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've been browsy client seven years ago. We met <laughs> in yeah. Tel Aviv yeah. In, yeah. In, in a very nice restaurant. And uh, I remember that we were talking about it yesterday. Um, and then left browsy using different technology and then came back to browsy a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, that 99% accuracy that we predict where the user is going to be next and we show the ad based on that. Um, it's not about every page, every session having X amount of ads. It's about where the user's attention is going to be and increasing the viewability, increasing the engagement, and so on and so forth. And this is kind of automation of you know, uh, personalization of the user experience on the page. Combined with that, we're also employing multiple other technologies, knowing every session, every page per second, how the engagement, what do we have on those pages? Do we have the video, do we have the, uh, just the, you know, uh, the embeds, or do we have any other elements on the page? How much session RPMs that we're earning on those pages? Knowing this per second, like real, in, in as real time as you can get, and you know, taking actions to those things is, is pretty important. And yes, it's, uh, that kind of helps us to engage with the user in more real time and giving them what they want and how they want to consume the page. Yeah, what you're saying, just to bring our previous panelists in, because I see so many opportunities, <laughs> um, with, it's not so different than what Andy was saying in terms of having the, the, the branded content above, the branded content below, no branded content, you know, and seeing the different impacts. Um, it's just here it sounds like you're talking more generally than just branded yep. content. So it's more of, a, more of a what do we give the user. Well, we've got the content, we've got the users. Mm -hmm. We have 100% organic users coming mm -hmm. to us on a day in, day out. Um, almost 6, 7 million people comes to us and we are the largest youth publisher in the world with a billion people following us. We are the largest TikTok publisher in the world with 300 million people on Facebook following us and so on and so forth. But we are giving it's this content. It content is there. <laughs> Um, people reading it, but we're just trying to customize mm -hmm. and engage with them in real time from a commercial point of view. Now, so. you're talking about using different technologies. I'm curious a bit, and maybe I'll, I'll bring in Asher for this, Stan. A lot of what you're talking about seems like it could have some impact on core web vitals. Um, UX in general, I know that maybe for some publishers it's been less of a priority than others. Um, especially for um, publishers with less organic traffic than you might have. And, and in those cases, I'm, I'm really interested to know how um, Google's policy changes and just in general, how, how do Core Web Vitals go into things? Yeah, for sure. So I think I'd like to start just by kind of echoing what Shazad said, that you know, as a mobile publisher, we are 85% mobile. We're not blessed with the same sort of kind of digital real estate that you may have on tablet or desktop. So you have to think a bit more holistically about the, the, the session, the actual session depth, because that's really where you're going to get values out of the user. 
Um, so you know, we you know, as Boons, we um, we look at things like session RPM, um, ads per session, session length, as ways in which we can evaluate our users and actually personalize them depending on what you know where they're coming from, social, Google, etc. In terms of Google Core Web Vitals, well, obviously because you're a mobile publisher, by definition, you have to keep an eye on user experience because if not, the user's going to exit early and that will damage not only your kind of real-time session revenue, but also if you're kind of a big brand like Lab Bible, the, the user retention rate and kind of the, the, the rate in which they come back because, you know, I know personally that if I'm, if I'm scrolling through Lab Bible or another similar, similar kind of news site, if I'm bugged by ads, I'm less likely to return. Um, so for us, yeah, I think Core Web Vitals has always kind of been, um, you know, vaguely something we're considering and actually you know google from kind of an seo side promoting that has actually just kind of made it a bit more concrete so for us for example uh, cumulative layout shift you know how much the content shifts within the kind of ad is very important in mobile mm -hmm. as well because you know there's only one screen small pixels uh, so you really need to be able to focus as you're kind of scrolling um, and so yeah it's it's just kind of formalizing what was a more kind of rule of thumb for mobile publishers i, I think i will say that historically, ad speed can be a bit of a grey zone for publishers. You know, it's a bit SEO, it's a bit tech, maybe monetization. But I think Google, with um, with the launch of kind of ad speed metrics within Google Ad Manager for those of you that, that, that use that ad server, they are kind of pushing it to publishers a bit more clearly now. So actually, you know, alongside the Core Web Vitals, which is more speed related, there's actually a whole suite of metrics to use. Um, so reports to pull in GAM like creative layout times, time between laying the, uh, loading the Google Publisher library and then actually the creative rendering. And actually you can build reports and analyze these metrics in a similar way to kind of monetization metrics like fill rate, RPM, visibility. So I think now, you know, whereas before it was a rule of thumb, we couldn't scale if our user experience was too aggressive because the session length, we just wouldn't have the, uh, the users or the capability to, to, to be profitable. But now I think for us as we grow, we're able to kind of separate actually and formalize you know, proper strategies, one for the tech team, for the content marketing team, focusing on core web vitals, maybe one at a time. Then also for the monetization team as well, you know, going after one specific metric, for example, creative load time, or maybe the distance between the tag on page and actually an ad being mm -hmm. shown. If you kind of, the more you can measure, the more you can strategize. And mm -hmm. I think Google um, are kind of making that known, so. Yeah. So, so I'm going to go off topic a little bit for my notes just because Great. the topic here is personalization and what we've been talking about is kind of the balance between UX and revenue. We're talking about core web vitals and how that plays into the UX portion of it. Um, but in general, I think um, the balance between UX and revenue really lies in personalization um, because that balance is a different spot for each user. Um, whereas instead of using the who, um, that Katrina was talking about um, to determine you know, what ad they see or what personalization they have, we're actually talking here about personalizing the, the layout and the experience more kind of similar to what Andy was talking about. Um, how, how do you think are the ways that different publishers you know, try and strike that balance? Um, Leroy, sure. do you have any? Uh... Yeah, I think that I'd start by asking the same question that Terry asked. First of all, what is UX? So publishers you know, think differently about user experience. Um, I remember that when we started, it was really about you know, the main metrics of um, you know, how many pages per session, stuff like that, which is really important. Um, and then it was pushed to latency because mobile became very uh, prominent in terms of traffic. And then Core Web Vitals became a thing. And, you know, Google is pushing everyone to try and do some stuff, whether it's AMP or now it's uh, Core Web Vitals. Um, and it was, I mean, and also in terms of the content, there are many, many different content strategies in terms of how publishers are actually deploying their content. So Lead Bible is doing something which Boone's probably not in terms of how they show content and how the actual article looks like, right? Um, and as Sherzel mentioned, there are not two users that are doing the same thing or behaving the same thing on the page. And to strike that balance uh, manually or just slapping an ad somewhere, um, this is what we think is, is sort of gone, or we hope so. Um, and eventually, you need some tech that gives you value, again, mm -hmm. as, as, as Terry mentioned, and be a partner and really talk about these things. So again, when UX uh, is changing from a publisher perspective, we need to react as a third-party vendor. 
um, and to help educate sometimes our publishers. Um, and this is what we've done many, many times. Like, all right, so what is Core Web Vitals? How do you actually look at it? How do you actually measure that? And the discussions that I have are uh, sometimes hilarious, sometimes sad, uh, because the knowledge sometimes is, is not at the publisher's side, which is uh, they should. Um, and I think eventually what you really need to do is just constantly A-B test. And again, I think that's something that Andy said. You really need to constantly A-B test and test stuff, whether that's third-party vendors or even your own things, right, in-house, um, and check how it works. This is what we provide in terms of ad layout, so we can really give different ad layouts to different uh, customers coming from different dimensions. Um, but it's not, not only about that. Uh, there are all, also technologies in terms of how you serve your ads um, and how you want to show the ads and where you want to show the ads uh, that needs to be testing as well. And I think the best uh, examples that I have is that when viewability became a very big thing, um, publishers started doing all sorts of stuff to take their viewability rate higher. One of the easiest things is to deploy um, lazy loading, which is basically waiting for the user to be near where the ad is if someone doesn't know what it is. Uh, technically speaking, it's very easy to do that and you have your viewability rate really high. But what happens is that you lose a lot of scale because before you were deploying lazy loading, you would just slap I don't know, five, six ads, depends on what you want to do. Um, and most of the users didn't really get to the place the, the ad is there. Um, so again, what we're trying to bring to the table is these type of technologies that really help test those type of, kind of things, um, mainly mobile, but also desktop. We do have some publishers that have desktop, which is, again, a different thing um, and needs to be handled differently. Uh, but yeah, I think that's it. Um. Thank you, Lior. Sure. Um, so Lior mentioned a few tactics. He talked about lazy loading. He talked about A-B testing. Um, Sherzad, um, Asher, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about which of these tactics you use, what other tactics you use um, in order to strike this balance? The lazy loading is, is the, the product that you guys offer. So, so we use that, It's of one course. of many. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah I mean, in terms of the dynamic insertion of the ads yeah, as yeah, the yeah. user goes mm -hmm. by. As, uh, Previously, what we did in uh, lab was the first and second ad slots were predominantly went to direct. We have huge direct sort of business and because they deliver the viewability and when user lands, it's just there mm -hmm. on your face and it shows. Now, since we're moving to browser, we, we can target any ad slot. It could be the 10th ad, just, you know, just making it up, the 10th ad for the direct because we know we're gonna launch it when we wanna hit 60%, 70%, 80% viewability. Mm -hmm. And then we can target any campaign we want. And we also had, we have multiple different products. We have um, Ladex, we have a uh, normal display, we've got social amplifier and lots of different products which, you know, not necessarily relevant for the audience here to know exactly what, which one is what. Then we had specific ad units for each one of them. Mm -hmm. And then it's extremely difficult and dynamically when we're serving this ad, do not serve this one because they're either the same brand or they don't necessarily go yep. sort of together or mm -hmm. whatever. The, the lot with the dynamic ads also making each ad slot being able to serve pretty much six or seven different products, mm -hmm. then we can build lots of different logics. So um, that's what we implemented about what mid September we went yeah. live. So yeah. this is a twelfth. The, on, so on the day the Quinn yeah. managed to die, yeah. and went live, yeah. and then everything go, started going south. Mm -hmm. But then uh, we picked up quite a lot. So we we we, we are testing, you mm -hmm. know, various different uh, methods. Also streamlining the operations, right? Okay, so we don't need each product having separate agents or each product having separate logics on the page. There's one thing can do multiple different combinations. And what about you, Asher? Yeah, for sure. So I think uh, there's kind of two areas in which we, well, I, I agree with the, the whole panel that you need to just test as much as possible all the time. Um, but I think there's kind of two areas we tend to focus on. One is a kind of surface level A-B test. So, you know, throughout the session, what is the, you know, the reasonable user willing to kind of tolerate and what's the kind of balance there? So um, like shows all, we A-B test different formats, different ad densities, different placements of the ads as well. Uh, right now we do that uh, in-house and have had some success, but we're, we're exploring kind of th third party options. Um, and then there's also kind of on the other side, the kind of below the surface tests, you know, being a bit more creative with 
how the content's being served, can we improve the speed and thus user experience? So things like you know, A-B testing refreshes, for example, both in-house and then with third parties, because uh, that's a quite good way to increase the ads per session without actually increasing the pixel mm -hmm. exposure to the users. Um, we've also been testing different formats as well, so uh, within the same kind of ad slot, you know, so looking at previous latest update, update and seeing if we can add in, you know, a bit of outstream or a bit of native within the same slots. Also, I think from the other side as well, it's important to note that for the speed, obviously the user benefits because it's a smoother experience, the publisher benefits on, on server costs, but I think also kind of further up the, or further, you know, into the industry, up the kind of bid stream. Um, a lot of SSPs are looking to kind of uh, optimize the revenue per request as a metric that the publishers are serving to. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, a lot of publishers using header bidding or client side as well are um, working with quite heavy stacks. I know certainly we were. So we are also did some A-B tests with you know, uh, reducing the kind of requests per SSP we're sending, you know, really evaluating our, our ad stack you know, client side, seeing for any bidders that weren't performing, testing kind of external bid reduction tools as well. So um, yeah. Lots of tests. <laughs> um, lots of tests. Sounds like something my high school kids would not be excited about. <laughs> um, so we've talked a little bit about um, the current situation. Um, what about the future? Where do you think uh, all of this is headed? Want me to start? Um, sure. Wow. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that you know, we're in a panel talking about personalization. The entire discussion here is about personalization, and I'm sure this is where we're going. Um, I really think, and connect to what Terry's mentioned, I don't, I don't th think it's going to be too personalized because it, it is scary. Um, and when we're talking about privacy, I think users, when they think about privacy, they don't really realize that people are tracking them <coughs> along the line. They just hear those kind of things. Oh, I said something. Near, near my phone and then I saw an ad on Facebook, so Facebook is listening to me. Those kind of things are more apparent to users. I don't think they really realize what's happening when, a service, when an ad is being served. Um, but I think eventually what we'll see is a more personalized content. So if I'm looking at how does a website is going to look like, I believe the homepage and especially content recommendations are going to be more personalized to some extent. Um, together with the actual ads, how they are being served, together with Hopefully, uh, if first party data really kicks in and publishers take this opportunity to really understand their uh, users, then eventually the, the users can really get more personalized ads themselves that are really relevant and are not really scary. So, and, and we see advances all around, whether it's Prebid, which is open source and lets everyone uh, enjoy the technology and, and do some stuff. Um, we see it around the identifiers, solutions that are less scary than third-party cookie um, and with more AI, obviously, uh, to some extent. Uh, yeah, this is where, where I see the future. What about uh, you uh, folks? Sure. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, so I think I, I, I do agree. I think, um, I think as we, you know, there's been a lot of talks there about you know, AI and kind of predictability, and I think that's definitely going to uh, expand into the mainstream. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, a lot of SSPs are really looking to kind of optimize their supply paths. Um, to kind of the, the brands and agencies and buyers. And I think that um, they're really looking to kind of guarantee to kind of the DSPs and agencies there's a certain level of viewability, uh, which they can kind of package. So I think kind of we'll see the, the wide stream, uh, wide frame adoption, the kind of predictive inventory packaging uh, from SSPs, which obviously impacts the publisher because, uh, you know, any kind of optimizations on the viewability, and that can be personalized based on, you know, the age of the user or where the user's coming from or kind of what, you know, where they kind of saw the site. Um, but yeah, I think kind of this predictive element uh, is, and kind of this the speed uh, and customizing of the of viewability is really going to come together um, in kind of a predictive AI shaped nugget. Yeah. Thank you. Talk too much, so before yeah. I ask Sherazad about his vision of the future, just all this talk about viewability reminded me very briefly, because I know I'm almost at time, um, of the conversation we had about conflicting goals. I think it's a question that this somebody had about <laughs> the conflicting goals um, internally. And it just reminded me of something funny that we actually used. We took it um, anonymized, of course, for our demo um, in our viewability dashboard. 
Um, if, if you didn't understand from what Sherazad was saying, our, our solution, when we create the um, ad slots, we send with the ad request uh, a key value with the viewability prediction um, so that it can be assigned to PMPs and you know, other direct campaigns. Um, so uh, as part of that, we also help measure and say, okay, where are your units with your highest viewability going? And uh, we had a client that we found uh, that their highest viewability ad units were all going, well, not 85% of them were going to house ads, um, which if your main goal is to get subscribers, then fine. But, you know, otherwise maybe it's not uh, what the publisher actually would have wanted if they had been able to make that decision um, ahead of time. Um, so uh, just anecdotal. Uh, anyway, it's your turn, Sherzad. <laughs> I'm... <clears throat> Ten years ago, we wouldn't have known probably what today's readers and, and consumers would have consumed the news mm -hmm. and which way and how. Probably very difficult to know what's the next five years and ten years. The way we look at it is, is our audience is, if not the consumers today, they are consumers of tomorrow. They, 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 these are, this is the generation that everybody is after. They are students. They are just starting their lives in you know, adulthood and whatever. So at Lad Bubble, we need to evolve with these changes and we need to catch up with these changes and we should be the ones that are actually catching up with the outside speed of the change um, on everything, including the ad and including the topic that we're discussing today. So I think the future is very automated, very AI-led, very data-centric. Or ML-led, uh, yeah. depending on yeah. <laughs> Very data-centric and, and reactive. Um, yeah, you can, do, you can be proactive on these things operations mm -hmm. from if I'm coming from my particular area the, the, um, and capturing every moment and making the best monetary value out of that situation as you can so um, yeah um, data AI automation so, those, those <laughs> so more 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 really more of words. what uh, people are talking about already <laughs> yeah, I think it really more, echoes more the tech, previous panel yeah. Um, so I just want to recap, because I know it's getting late. Um, it sounds like we're at the beginning. I already kind of recapped my recap. <laughs> so um, I want to take questions briefly, if uh, anyone has any questions for, for the panel. I have a question. Sure. <clears throat> so I mean, like, we're all overwhelmed with data, right? Mm -hmm. like big data, big data, big data. And all the publishers that my company works with, I'm with JW Claire. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they've got so much data, they don't know what to do with it. Yep. Um, so half of it's just like, what do we do with it? So not, I mean, how, how often do you guys actually bring in your target customers, sit down and just like, you know, have a conversation like this? I'm just cu I'm curious. Um, Are you from JW? I, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. I was speaking to Brian the other day, so. Cool. Um, <laughs> um, we have something called Lad Nation and we have thousands if not tens of thousands of people just uh, are members of that lab nation and we conduct a lot of research and we ask questions from these people about what's the social events happening around them or the, um, the economic situations or what's impacting them as well as their experience with LAD, right? So with, with, with LAD, LAD Bubble Group. So yeah, we do ask, yes, you're right. Have, knowing something and having the data is one thing, and doing something about it is another thing. Um, we are one of the very few publishers, if not the only publisher, using smart um, flooring within um, the Pribit solutions, as well as including that at the same time, simultaneously with the TAM, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's a huge risk, and we're looking at it. We're increasing the CPMs and RPMs and impressions and set ads per sessions and stuff like that. Um, Great, I looked at the data this morning, fantastic, and I'm asking the team, what do we do with it? So, we don't know. Well, you either think about maintaining the growth, going that way, or how do we make more money? How can I make the sort of graphs a bit more steeper and things like that? So, yes, we ask internally the people actually acting on the data or collecting the data and you know, doing something with it, as well as our audiences the same time, so we, we, we work on multiple different channels. I think that uh, one of the things that more and more publishers are realizing is that working with vendors who just provide data, even if it's actionable data, 
is a lot less valuable than working with vendors that act on the data. Um, and this goes back to what, um, what Andy was saying about the rules that can be set up by the marketers. And then you have the AI and, and trying to make them work together. It's something we also do because basically anyone who sells something, you guys also do. You give your publishers, a JW Player gives the publishers a lot of ability to do configurations, everything. So anytime we do that, right, so we give the ability to set a lot of UX rules in our solution. And the more UX rules that the publisher sets, the less room there is for the AI to play, right? But in theory, the more room the AI has to play, um, the more the AI can just act on the data and the insights. So the AI can say, oh, we find that people who come in at 10 in the morning in UK, direct from Google, um, like from search, um, and they go to an article within their first 30 seconds on the site, um, are more likely to scroll down to a lower depth even if they have three ads in the way, okay? And their internet's fast and so they'll all have time to load and they can use lazy load, you know? And we can refresh it when it's here because they're gonna pause here and it's gonna stay in view. It's not gonna move, you know? So we can make all those decisions instead of just providing the insight and say, hey, you wanna target these people with three ads. We just do it. And I find that more and more publishers are looking for technology solutions that just do it um, instead of giving data that then isn't relevant by the time you need to make a decision on it. Yeah. Um, any other questions? No, everyone wants to, oh yes. Um, yeah, I'm keen to understand how you find the balance between kind of in-session ad optimization and mm -hmm. just more broadly the lifetime value of the user. So I think if you ask our UX team, they would just switch off ads for everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And um, which, which publisher are you with? Try out for Immediate Media. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and we're kind of going through this process at the minute where we try and understand what the kind of page layout should look like for particular types of audiences. So how do you guys <coughs> that? So I hear you when you say, you know, the UX team will probably doesn't want ads at all. Uh, I think I hear it from Charles <laughs> every day, uh, getting it from his UX team as well. Uh, and to be honest, um, when we started this concept uh, of actually showing ads differently to different users, when we got to talk to AdOps people, <coughs> they realized right that it might be beneficial for them. Uh, the next hurdle was UX for product teams where usually the question would be, all right, I understand that it is dynamic and I understand that it is personalized, but eventually they want to know where ads are going to be. And this was a question that we got uh, very often and we sort of struggled to answer, I don't know if correctly is the right word, but eventually what we've done is um, we created a lot of levers to actually play with the UX of the site, allowing the UX team, the product team, the ad ops team, everyone. The <laughs> yeah, to be, to be really in control, to sort of say the opposite, where you don't want the ads to be. So instead of going on the positive here, sort of like, okay, where are the ads are going to be? Because the answer for that would be, I have no idea, honestly. Uh, if you go on the site using our technology, you'll probably get a different position of an ad than me. Um, so honestly, I don't know. Um, but to sort of relax the hesitation around UX is we put it all together to make sure that eventually you won't have ads where you don't want them, whether that's, uh, you know, the distance between the ads, whether that's around embeds that you have, uh, whether that's around, I don't know, very strange things um, that our publishers have or a very uh, generic thing like Tabula doesn't want to have an ad right below, uh, sorry, right above where they start, for example. <coughs> and and so. we allow testing it, right? Yeah, so we have an A-B option so that our publishers will often have the UX rules that the, the team thinks that they want to have and then they can have a portion of their traffic that just lets the AI do what it wants and they can compare the two very easily in our pla on our platform. But I think the other way that we've gotten around this is simply focusing on the incremental additions that we can bring um, and explaining to the UX team, listen, you have complete control over all of your fixed positions, they're still yours. However, when we identify a session where we have the ability to create incremental ads without hurting the UX and we're tracking all those measurements to prove it, 
then we will create those incremental ad units. You'll have the extra revenue. We're looking at the revenue per session altogether, so you get that extra page view. We're not taking it away from you, mm -hmm. um, but we are, um, we're, we're creating that balance. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or, yeah. I could actually add a, yeah. a publisher Please. perspective as well. So I think like, you know, obviously it's important to A-B test, and when you're, when you're doing user experience A-B mm -hmm. tests, um, the, the type of user experience changes that will lead people to kind of never visit the site again tend to kind of speak for themselves when you run it against kind of your, your existing user experience, especially when you're in mobile. I know immediate media has uh, desktop too, but I think, you know, uh, when you talk about browsing, you know, or, or testing kind of incremental value, once a user in a mobile and probably more broadly, you know, on, on desktop as well, it's in the session, they're probably there to kind of stay. I think it's mainly the, the changes, you know, you, you double the ad density or all of a sudden you refresh every five seconds when you were at 30 before. That tends to kind of lead users to say, mm, I've tried, screw this, I'm done, you know. Um, so I think, you know, it, with like running A-B tests on user experience, it, it, in my experience, it's a lot clearer to kind of see the, the warning signs, like from even day of using real-time reporting, kind of hour one, um, versus, you know, A-B testing something, you know, a speed optimization, which, you know, might affect SSPs or kind of, or, or programmatic bidding in which you probably need a little bit more time. But I think for user experience, I, I mean, this is just my opinion, but uh, when you've messed it up, it kind of is quite obvious. <laughs> well, I think <clears throat> users are no long, not just not visiting your site just because they see a couple of extra ads. Yeah. It, there's a content, there is a tone, mm -hmm. there is a kind of things that they want to read. <clears throat> and ads, they, they, I think, majority of the sort of population understands that it's a value exchange has to happen. My wife is an ad blocker, but I pay the mortgage with the ads that I work on, right? It's a, so it's, it's, it's a really kind of fine balance that some people do these things. Some, but it, the return of the long-term value is very, very important, but also it's not just the ads. And just don't tell your ads in the UX team. They don't like ads. So. <laughs> 